RCR with Paul Brennan, Reality Check Radio. Friday morning is our political panel morning here on RCR. I want to welcome back. I'm going to do it in reverse order this time. Marty Gibson. Love Good morning. How are you doing? Love that paneling. <laughs> it's the it's the ongoing joke. The panel, the panel, and the paneling. Yeah, it's authentic. You can't see it, listeners, but it's it's panel to the max. So that's Marty, Olivia. Good to see you back. Hello, Paul. Again, nice to see you. Thank you, and Cam Slater. Good morning, boy. Paul, and everybody else. You naughty naughty. Boy. What, what, what's this naughty boy stuff? Well, I've had to be dealing with. In, let's get this out of the way first. I've been dealing with incomings, mostly complaining about you. Oh, boo hoo. Here's a sample. I won't pull them all out because it'll take too much time. <laughs> but here's a sample. I'm a little concerned at your pushing one agenda, namely New Zealand First, with not only Cameron's political time, but another I heard this Monday morning, and that must have been me, I think. Um, yes, you've had other Freedom Party leaders on, but when Cameron says there is no one else out there to fight for freedoms, well, this is false. <laughs> Freedoms NZ is a group of parties traveling the country and growing momentum. Look, I, I don't mean to sound funny in my voice, but I'm just trying to animate this. Mm. Let's support all freedom parties, or is your agenda only to discuss Winston Peters with an apostrophe S? Yes. Don't go MSM on us. Don't just focus on your catch ups on New Zealand first. That dishonors freedom. Right. Well, I'm not in the, in the, a lock for anybody. No one can buy me. Um, you know, one thing I learned from Nikki Hager's Dirty Politics is there's no point actually being a lock for any one party or anything because you just get labelled, right? And so I'm not a lock for New Zealand First, and I haven't even decided who I'm going to vote for yet. But, you know, I'm a political commentator. I make money out of being right. And being wrong is no money in that for me to be wrong. And people come to my site to understand my depth of knowledge in politics. I've been doing this all of my life, basically since I could crawl. Um, I've been doing it longer than any of the current gallery journalists. In fact, if you probably added up their time in the gallery, you just remove Barry Soper as an aberration. He's probably been doing this as long as I have. Right. So I've got a lot of history involvement in political parties, associated with political parties, training politicians. And what I'm known for is saying what I think and thinking what I say. Let's look at this from facts and details. So there's an umbrella party, a so-called umbrella party. It involves Brian Tamaki and his destiny crowd. It's got Sue Gray's lot and then some guy called Michael Jacome from New Nation Party. They've formed this umbrella party. The highest number of votes that any of those constituent parties has ever got was in 2005, was Destiny New Zealand, and they got about as many votes as there were parishioners in Brian Tamaki's church, around 14,000 votes, or 0.62% of the vote. The family party, which was Brian Tamaki and City Impact Church, they actually, in 2008, got 8,000 votes, so less than their parishioners at 0.35% of the vote. The New Zealand Outdoor Party in 2017, 1,620 votes in the whole country, 0.1%. And the Outdoors Party in 2020, they doubled their um, result. They had 3,256 votes in 2020, but still only 0.1% of the vote. If you add up all of those minor parties you still don't get 20,000 votes. You've got no chance of winning 5% or a seat to enter parliament. They can merge with all the minor parties who have ever, ever be, never been in parliament and they still won't get that 5% threshold. So when I'm talking about um, parties that are going to possibly make it into parliament, I'm dealing with reality. I'm not dealing with hopium. I'm not dealing with prayers. I'm dealing with facts. And if you don't like facts, well, then perhaps I'm not the guy that's going to give you any answers. All right. Um, we've got a few things to get through in this political panel. And first on the list that I have here, first on the list is Michael Wood, the river of filth guy, how the mighty can fall. 
Well, I don't know about how, mighty. How pleasant <laughs> it is to watch. I mean, oh. I, I mean, we've said more than once that that man that issued that epithet of river of filth, you know, turns out to be a filthy, corrupt, lying, um, greedy pig capitalist pretending to be a socialist. I mean, it doesn't get lower than that. I thought he was a giant socialist weasel, and it turns out that he's a snivelling, um, cowardly um, capitalist hiding under a bushel. I mean, we talk, we're talking about Big Mac chips and a Coke investments here that have cost him his career. He had a blind He spot. had the best best job he's ever going to get. It, <laughs> Talk to you about that um, Twitter user Spandrel who who floated this idea of biological Leninism, and <laughs> yeah. he said socialism works not only because it promises higher status to a lot of people. Socialism is catnip because it promises status to people who deep down know they shouldn't have it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, and the reason that it does that, and the reason that uh, it, it's so focused on outliers in society, is because they're loyal. And, you know, we've seen uh, democracy and Z fall, fall to bits. The people who walked are lawyers, doctors. You know, they've, they've got something to go to. Well, if that's you're a right. menswear salesman and you're unionist, you know, and you're on four or 500K, you can, you can un understand they've got a bit of, um, what do you call out outsider uh, anxiety? Imposter, imposter syndrome. syndrome. Imposter syndrome. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think Michael Wood ever had imposter syndrome. He thought he was the cat's business. You know, he was a little Napoleon and he thought he had the answers for everything. You know, if you go back and look at all of his statements, you know, before he became an MP, I mean, he was, he spent a lifetime being Phil Goff's understudy and lickspittle and he's destroyed it all over this insistent on something like about $20,000 worth of shares. This was a prime opportunity for the mainstream media to have some decent headlines. Like, you know, what was, what would have been wrong with, government cuts out more dead wood or wood was rotten to the core or wood finally gets nailed or, <laughs> you know, there's all the... Hipkins loses his wood. Yeah, Hipkins puts wood through the chippy. <laughs> 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 you know, something like that. You know, what did we get? All these weaselly little headlines. I think it, it shows a clear competence bypass in Labour's caucus and in ministry. And I think that's what we saw with Chris Hipkins. He's sitting there thinking, when will this end? How can I? I mean, he held the press conference as close to two o'clock as he could, right? So, so he had to, he answered some questions and then had to bolt to go into the parliament. But I think he was sitting there completely shell-shocked because he's realised that the problem that he's got as prime minister is that his talent pool is as shallow as a bird bath in an Auckland summer. And I think that he also realises that the problems he's got in his caucus are endemic and systemic and there's nothing he can do about it. He should look at himself. But that's a comment on the whole of politics in New Zealand especially, but you see it all over the world, is politics attracts an extremely low calibre of person now. All their talent pools are, sh are shallow it's because they're, you know, to read from that, you know, essay again, the early Soviet Union, Union promoted minorities, women, sexual deviants, atheists, cultists, and every kind of weirdo, everyone but intelligent conservative Russians of good families. They're, well, they're they've all, got loyalty. They were all they've dead. They've got nowhere to go. The conservatives that's, were all where dead. where inquisitiveness came from. But, they're, they're, I mean, socialism is not called the politics of envy for nothing. And when you're brandishing and enacting and living a, a political system that's socialist run on envy, you're going to attract very scummy people who are jealous, mm. envy, envious, small-minded and petty. And that's the scum that rises to the top. And that's what we're watching right now, which is what, why it, it makes it so painful to watch. It's not painful to watch. It's no, no, I don't think it's delicious. painful. <laughs> it's delicious. Really? There's, nothing, there's okay. nothing better than watching a, cra a, plane, a, you know, a train crash. It's like why people go to the speedway. They go there to, not to see the racing. They go there no, to see the No, you, but you're, you're saying yourself that this uh, is so small-minded. I mean, what, $20,000 worth of chorus shares, spark shares, airport shares, um, you know, it, the, the smallness of it and that he was willing to die in a ditch over it exactly shows you that. So it's Is that it, though? Painful to Is watch. that it? Is that where it ends or is there more? 
Well, well you, you look at tip of the iceberg, I would say. Chloe, no, no, with Mr. Wood. I mean, what else is there? All, all this talk about, you know, this problematic um, money you know, and, and all this money in the back pockets. You Google Chloe Wood's um, initiatives and giving away some of that burden, some cash. You can't find it. They don't, socialists don't give away money. No, they like to use. They like to give away other people's money. Yeah, they've got yeah. weird ideas about money. Yeah. I, you know, Margaret Thatcher had the right ideas. So the tr- trouble with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money to spend. Yeah, that's right. This can't be good for the credibility of their chances in seventeen weeks. Yeah, but we're talking about a, you know a vast number of people in New Zealand are just plain stupid. You know, we saw that in twenty twenty in the election. COVID was an intelligence test and most people failed it. All right. Well, let's look at the the issue of competency then regards Labour and we've got a bit of a laundry list here. Well, in just this week, um, you know, their huge initiative um, to expand the early childhood education announcement um, at the budget, um, they've had to change the policy because, uh, whoopsie, it doesn't work. And none of the people in the ECE, you know, community, the providers and that can actually deliver what they're talking about. So they've had to backtrack on that. Then there's their free public transport mm-hmm. policy, um, which is for, you know, people under the age of, God knows, I don't take public transport, so I didn't sort of bother finding 25. out. 25. Um, but there isn't a single public transport provider in New Zealand that collects data for date of birth and it doesn't have it on any of their, you know, electronic cards or any of their payment systems or any of that sort of thing. So they can't actually implement it because they can't restrict it to people who are under 25. Yeah, I've, I've cautioned before about, you know, you think they're doing a bad job. Maybe they're doing a really good job and you just don't know what the job is because there was Nash in the paper saying, what was really needed was a government-backed portal with an age verification system. Ah, here we go. And it for the government to hold that data, which could then be used for by every council in the country. For oh, buses, you understand? Yeah, yeah you, for buses and, oh, Purchasing and we'll, we'll, we'll link that to your bank account mm, too. Yeah. Oh, the firearms register, we'll do that. We can agree that there is a competency, a number of competency issues then, I think. We can agree on that. Well, evidenced by what we've just been talking about. Well, we, we would we would have seen this incompetence rise to the surface a lot earlier if the media hadn't been bought off. All right, are we done on that? Well, it's a bit hard to talk about stupidity for too long. Yeah, we don't want to go too long on that. Um, though we might be jumping into another fire here out of the frying pan. Durham testifying, I've watched a bit of that, and Olivia, I'm sure you've got some... Something to say on that. Well, I mean, I don't know if this is where I'm probably a bit of a girly swat. I love watching those five-hour House Judiciary Committee hearings. I just find them fascinating because it actually is people being called to account publicly, which we do, as I've said many times, we don't even have that facility. Especially if Jim Jordan's involved. Yeah, Jim Jordan's great being the chair. But um, so the funny thing is, is that um, Schiff, when he, pencil neck, as Trump always calls him, little pencil neck. um, Shifty Schiff. Shifty Schiff. He, when it came to to his um, interview of of Durham or to ask questions, he, he, he just started absolutely running the same program that they've been running on Russia collusion. And he said that, um, you know, um, that the Trump Trump campaign had invited Russian help, received Russian help, made use of it, and then lied about it. Um, None of which is and, true. <laughs> well, he was referring, of course, he used the example of the thing that just strikes me as hilarious when Trump went, hey, Russia, if you're listening, hack Hillary's emails. You'll be richly rewarded by the press, which, let's face it, he said um, at every rally. Um, and then Schiff claimed that according to the Mueller report, um, which was pathetically lame, but um, and also a couple of years ago now, but it said that um, hours after Trump made that first statement um, at a rally, um, that there was a Russian attempt to hack the server 
I mean, honestly, says him. Imagine taking Hillary Clinton's word for anything on this, like, oh, my server's been hacked, and I thought the server was missing and being bleach pitted, so I don't even know how they know that. Um, then he went on and started saying that Don Jr. was offered high-level dirt on Hillary Clinton through that phone call offering to meet with a Russian woman and divulge the information. And apparently Don Jr. said, um, if it's what you say, I love it, you know, dirt on Hillary Clinton, but nothing came of it. They never used that meeting to go any further. Nothing was acted upon. Yet Schiff was here desperately trying to call this Russian help. Mm -hmm. um, he's just grasping at straws. And, you know, Durham said that, you know, sure, People get phone calls all the time offering all sorts of things. Yep. And um, Schiff drilled him harder going, really? The son of a presidential candidate gets calls all the time from a foreign government offering dirt on their opponent? Is that what you're saying? Um, to which Durham shot back, I don't think the situation is unique in your experience, you know, <laughs> referencing the fact that, I mean, the Democrats are masters of dirt and that's all they ever had on Trump that they made up. It was an incredible exchange, really, because um, the lies that these people are continuing to perpetuate whilst knowing their own lies are now under investigation. And interestingly enough, um, the House now censured Adam Schiff for his, you know, all lies. His, his lies. For, for his lies. So they censured him on specifically spreading false accusations that the Trump campaign colluded with Russia perpetuating false allegations about the Steele dossier, accusing numerous Trump associates of colluding with Russia. Skipping and, Nick Day. Yep. Um, and this is all going to go before the Ethics Committee now to conduct an in investigation into shifts, falsehoods, misrepresentations and abuses of sensitive information because, of course, he specifically was leaking to the press all the time, exactly what Bill Barr is now doing now on the Sunday shows, um, smearing Trump. I mean, they are carrying this on. It's not gone. We're just going to get another massive iteration. Didn't Barr's father hire Epstein? Bill Barr's father? Yeah, yeah he was a principal some... of a school who hired Epstein, I'm pretty yeah. sure. Chuck Schumer's uh, interview with Rachel Maddow was from, I think, uh, after the 2016 election, but that's been resurfacing. And Chuck uh, Schumer said to Rachel Maddow, let me tell you, you take on the intelligence community. They have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. Yep. Uh, so even for a practically supposedly hard-nosed businessman, he's being really dumb to do this. <laughs> so, you know, basically, you, well, we're going to weaponize the FBI. They've made good on that threat, too. They've gone after Trump with everything they've got. Well, here, here's the other thing. That process demonized Russia. And that demonization of Russia is now why there's a war. Yeah. It's why it's acceptable war. or was anyway, maybe not so much now to the American public or a good deal of them because of that. So there's blood on their hands. Yeah. I mean, it's gone. And, and let's face it, there doesn't seem to be an end to that war in sight. And from what I'm reading and the information I'm getting, Ukraine is losing that war. They're being and, slaughtered. And, and the more that they lose that war, the more... Um, America keeps sending money, weapons, and probably troops. They're just not going to tell us. And whether they're well, capable of fighting out of the news at the moment hmm. about um, what's building up against the West as well. The West trying to present Russia as marginalised, but you know, there's this big um, drive in Africa for de-dollarisation. You know, an African monetary fund backed by gold, raw materials, just similar to what Gaddafi was doing before Hillary Clinton. You know, did the old. We took her out. Ride. Took him out. <laughs> Thing. I mean, there's, you know, the China's <laughs> got the Belt and Road stuff. Um, and, you know, they've got a, a much kinder attitude to uh, the aspirations of developing nations to actually develop, you know, rather than just be patronized. They forgive debt a bit more. Uh, there's all sorts of talks going on with 100 countries, and it's just absolutely nothing about it in New Zealand's media, which is, I think, why they jumped on the morning report reporter are the uh well we've picked our side haven't we no one asked me by the way but <laughs> well i don't pick any side in this whole thing the ukrainians are as bad as the russians they're all a bunch of just crazies just dumping on each other i don't know why we bothered with any of this we should just let them have at it and it doesn't affect us they bothered with this specifically because it was going on in 2015 
um, with the attacks on Trump and the pushing of the Russia collusion hoax. I mean, this whole thing has got a long trajectory that's, of course, longer than that. But this is where they brought it into the public mind and the American mind anyway, was by basically trying to spin the line that, you know, Trump was a treasonist in league with Vladimir Putin. Um, and now, as Paul points out rightly, that this has gone to war. Um, and remember, it was Biden who said no, I looked there's in. No, there's no handbrake to it. You know, there's B- no- Biden said that he looked into Putin's eyes and what did he say? There was nothing there. Or- I think that was. Um, I think there was Putin was George Bush. Into- well, Bush, or one of them anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to. I just want to. That, that's good for relations. There's nothing like there. The I think it was Biden. Face. I don't think it was Bush because he was pooty poot to Bush. Remember? What do you see when you look in Biden's eyes? Glaze, um, confusion. Yeah, confusion. A dead man walking. Yeah. yeah. And and that's the other story. I don't know if it's on the list, but Hunter Biden's been let off with a, a wet bus ticket, um, and yet yeah. um, others have Take gone to jail wrist. for ten plus years for what he's done, especially with uh, gun. The gun ownership a, of, by crack yeah, addict. That's a that's a federal felony. The, yeah. the gun charge. If there had been Trump who'd done that, he'd be facing forty years in jail. And there's yeah. all that evidence on the laptop, and you know, there's horrible stuff on that that could extend to trafficking, human trafficking. So, you know, <laughs> what the hell is going on? I, I know, but I, I, he's a protected species. It's like Labour Party politicians in New Zealand never get prosecuted. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. A protected species is exactly right. But just um, before we wind this up on the Durham thing, um, there was just so much in that hearing that was really good stuff. Matt Gates was exceptional, as he always is. But um, the person that really struck me was Harriet Hageman, who's the gentle lady from Wyoming. Um, she was magnificent right at the end, and she said um, to Durham and the whole hearing. And if they failed to stop Trump from becoming president, they had a backup plan, an insurance policy that made it impossible for him to govern. It has left a smoldering, hot, volcanic mess where the soul of this country used to be, all because a few people in the FBI decided they wanted to destroy a political candidate and ultimately a president and anyone associated with him. They destroyed so much, and that will be their ultimate legacy. They destroyed a justice system that is meant to be applied equally to all Americans. And then she offered only one question to Durham and said, How long do you think this country will survive with a two-tiered justice system that seeks to persecute people based on their political beliefs? And Durham answered, I don't think things can go too much further with the view that the law enforcement and particularly the FBI and Department of Justice runs a two-tier justice system. The nation can't stand under those circumstances. Wow, wow. And I mean, yeah. no country, that actually is reminiscent of Lincoln's speeches when he was trying to become president, when they were dealing with slavery, his great speech, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And it truly cannot. Um, we know this here in New Zealand, you offer us a two-tier justice system, and that's what we got with all the um, apartheid and the medical coercion and all that. Um, Jacinda famously said, yep, yep, that's exactly what it is. With a Um, smile. With a smile. And now we're here um, still raying against that. We will not let it pass. Well, that means that we possibly won't stand long term either if we carry on this way. Well, New New Zealand's never had a revolution. We've never had a civil war. No, or a civil war or a reformation or anything. It's overdue. And the way that the divisive policies of this government are being rammed home, not just the COVID policies, but race-based policies as well. You know, and we're seeing this on a day-to-day basis where, you know, we've got separation of various different micro groups within society. It's this divide and rule uh, methodology that the left wing just loves to to have where everybody's at each other's throats over seemingly tiny and insignificant things. But the whole idea is to A, distract you and B, uh, to subjugate you at the same time, which is why we're seeing these pushes for you know, uh, hate speech um, rules and uh, having this this organisation overseeing what we're saying online or saying, um, you know, in the media and all of these things, they're all designed to subjugate us. Well, they've and, done it for 100 years. What we're witnessing is the absolute fruition of 100 years of that. 
and the apathy of conservatives uh, to stand up to it is is the reason why it's allowed to march through. Yeah. I mean, and eventually it comes to violence. Yeah. Um, I'm not condoning violence. I abhor violence. But eventually this sort of division in society comes to violence. Always, always. Yeah. It always does. You can't. You can't um, persecute a whole sector of your population um, and expect them to just take it. No, they won't. They, they will. They will rise up one way yeah. or another. If they've still got a pulse, they will. Just a question of when. Mm. All right. Okay. We're up to gaslighters. It's our award, right? Well, we can't do Jenny Anderson again, even though she's. <laughs> I mean, she's still out there pushing it, but, you know, I think what we have to do is we have to award it to the entire staff of Stuff. Oh. For their article, fact-checking claims about New Zealand's 2022 death rate and the excess deaths. Oh, okay. So they're running defence? Well, you might think that, but um, when you read the article, they actually say, Oh, well, there is an increase in the deaths, but yeah. it was up ten percent. But yeah, it's only it's, a once it's, in a two hundred year spike. It's ten percent higher, and the last time we had a spike like this was nineteen eighteen. Oh, gee, I wonder what happened in nineteen. Oh, that's right, there was a bit of a flu epidemic then, and a world war, and a world war. But um, look, it's actually because old people, oh, aging population, aging, aging. population, oh, how aging. pathetic, aging hey. population <laughs> is the problem. Yeah, okay. But in the article, it says, um, before we go any further, it's important to note 2020 and 2021 were abnormal years. New Zealand had very little COVID, fewer than 50 deaths, or influenza. Well, that's all right then. Deaths over winter in 2020 in particular were much lower than in other years, which just goes to admit that the pandemic itself was fear-mongering load of bollocks. In 2020, even though our borders were shut, um, well, to some anyway, others will let through, remember. But the so called Yeah, the so-called highly contagious virus was out in the open air of our country, yet excess deaths did not occur until the en masse vax was rolled out. So, well duh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The Sky, Sky News um surprised me actually did a, a piece and it never got replayed here, but earlier this year they said Australia's excess deaths are like a fully loaded 747 crashing every week. Yeah. And you'd oh, think right. if that was happening, the, the media would be interested in it. They uh, are pretending it's not happening. They're totally yeah. pretending it's not happening. And even Guy Hatchard um, said, I think yesterday, um, that he saw a Trade Me Jobs advertisement still requiring that a condition of employment for this role is that you are vaccinated against COVID-19, including a booster dose. Without a vaccine, there is a risk that you may contract COVID-19 or pass it to other staff. This can place an increased burden on our healthcare system. That is in employment ads. It's well, just, boycott that company. But, you know, the stuff, stuff in their fact-checking article actually quietly admitted that um, COVID-19 was actually bugger all nothing. And actually the flu is is the biggest driver of deaths in, you know, in the winter season. They quietly said that, you know, just missed all that out. And then they don't even mention at all that then these numbers rocketed up after mass vaccination started. You look yeah. at all the graphs, all the spikes are all connected to the rollout. Yeah. Mean, like, meanwhile, they keep claiming, you know, um, we had a very low death rate. Well, whoop de do. But here's the thing. Why do these people expect that New Zealand will be different from the rest of the world that did exactly the same thing? We won't be. But we were late. We were months and months and months behind all of these other countries. Um, th that uh, delay being lagging behind, that makes it even more evil. Yeah, because we could see what was coming. It was obvious. We, we had a six-month almost advanced window into how things were shaping up. So we had a chance. We bloody blew it. Yep. What's well, the thing that makes you so wild about all, all of the stuff that these guys are doing? It's, it's done totally politically. So, you know. And the media it, it, were involved. They were in on it. Yeah, but it's in people's lives, guys. 
I know. You know, but, but this, this life don't... and death. They're constantly still saying correlation does not imply causation. BS. You know, and it's like, I'm sorry, but <laughs> correlation is often an early red flag to causation. Let's look down there, but they just refuse to. So I had mm. Ed Dowd on the other day. Yeah, that was brilliant. Paul. And he said, I think he said in the chat, he said that anecdotal is the first sign. Yeah. Never ignore anecdotal. No, it's the first. And if you get multiple flag. anecdotals, something's happening for sure. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. So stuff uh, other gas later of the week. The entire staff. Yeah. Well, we, we should deliver it to Sinead Bosher though. Being I see they're all having to reapply for their jobs. Do you see that? Yeah, that gurgling sound you can hear. Being sucked through the system. The all right. sewer. Okay. I just need that blood pressure to go down a bit. Hmm. Race-based health waiting lists, Marty. Yeah, I mean this. Um, this is an interesting one. My um, my old man was a GP in uh, predominantly Maori part of town, Gisborne, for thirty six years, and I asked him about that. I said, you know, is the uh, health system racist? And his reply was, no, that's absolute effing bullshit. Um, but he, he said he had had a young Maori female visiting doctor say, you know, evidence for it being racist was the late referral of Maori with congestive heart failure. Maori with congestive heart failure uh, present to hospital further down the track. And he disputed that because he tended to do the opposite because Maori don't do well with congestive heart failure. It tends to get away on them quickly. And it's, but he said it's one thing to write a referral. It's another thing to keep the appointment. Yeah, I was and Māori thinking that. are just significantly worse at turning up to appointments. They're a bit more fatalistic and my and may feel intimidated by hospitals, but that's not the hospital's fault. And he said the big problem is poverty, which in my opinion is another word for educational deficiency. You probably don't see the same disadvantages in more educated Māori, although they probably claim that you do. If people are educated and in charge of their destinies, they'll have better outcomes. If you're poor, you're not into forward planning or delaying gratification. Get pissed, have a fight, have a shag without thinking about it too much. That's uh, what he put it down to. And, and interestingly, when Ngāti Pro Haora was set up, it was very much this by Māori for Māori push. And it was going to revolutionise the health of Māori and do all sorts of things. And he was told that most of his patients would go there and at the time, his practice was 57% Māori. And two years later, it was 59% Māori. <laughs> kind of um, proves his point, doesn't it? Yeah, well, he said Māori are pretty smart when choosing a doctor, and they often have closer relationships with them. They're better at sniffing out bad doctors, no matter what race they are. They want someone they can relate to, trust, and see reasonably easily. Um, he said, yeah, they, these health authorities haven't created the transformation they were promised, but that's not what the health system's designed to do. It's basically a patch-up service and treats illness. And he said the idea of bias was bullshit also. Uh, I always did my best for my patients, even the ones I didn't like, and there were plenty of those nasty, violent bastards. If the kids, kids got educated, they did better, and most of them buggered off to Australia to get away from those environments. Wow. <laughs> The whole um, thing about this, though, the, the whole premise <laughs> of this race-based health or the, just for, of the reorganisation of the health system in the, in the first place, creating a segregated health system, was to have better outcomes. And now they're, you know, they, they said they were doing all of this so that they could remove the postcode lottery. Remember that catchphrase that yep. they used to say, you know, nationals run a postcode lottery health system. Well, all they've done is replaced the postcode lottery for a race-based lottery. I did a counselling paper at Waikato, which I'd gone to originally. <laughs> and so, uh, so Sorry, but Yeah. <laughs> you I know. We know where to go now. <laughs> Who to I see? asked my lecturer. It was a very postmodernist, constructionist, deconstructionist paper that I did. And I, I asked, do you think that white privilege is that when something's rotten in our culture, we can debate it, critique it, and remove it? But... Um, at the same time, we remove the agency of Māori by patronisingly telling them their culture that's delivering poor results is perfect and beautiful and all the bad stuff is someone else's fault. There was a very long pause after that. Everyone looked frightened. And I, th- I don't think this course is for you, Marty. 
<laughs> was yeah. the next words out of her mouth, wasn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, but that removal of agency always annoys me. You know, especially telling young people everything that's wrong in your life, someone else's fault. We, it's terribly we disempowering. The, we saw this with the COVID debacle, right? Are oh, we looking after vulnerable communities? They're telling all of these people that they're A, stupid, and B, vulnerable. If you tell people they're stupid and vulnerable for long enough, they'll act stupid and vulnerable. And that's exactly what we're seeing in society now today. Yeah. Well, I mean, women thought the CIA and the Rockefellers were uplifting them when they sponsored feminism in the 60s and 70s. But oh, what they were again. actually sponsoring was division and demoralization of their most likely opponents. And I suspect that what we're seeing here with this apparent uplifting of Maori is very similar. This, you know, disenfranchising of New Zealanders and saying you're not legitimately here. Well, no one's then- ever explained why there's a problem with access. No one's ever said, well, here's the reason why that I've heard. Anyway, I could have missed it. Uh, I mean, you turn up to a hospital with a problem or, I mean, they're not going to turn you away or say, sorry, sorry, um, we we like to deal with these people first. You stand there. I've heard no reason for this. The the most convincing reason is what Marty said is you've got to be motivated to just turn up, present. Yep. I have to be motivated to go to the doctor. I will do everything in my power to avoid going to a doctor. You know, I I let things slide. Um, I try healthy um, other alternative options. You know, going to the doctor for me is a last ditch. I've got a problem and I need to see someone. I I would imagine a lot of Maoris feel like that too. Well, maybe there's, you've there's got some Maori in you, Olivia. <laughs> I'm a little bit <laughs> I mean, white I mean, who, for that, but who I'd trusts like it the, the truth. Who trusts them now? Who actually trusts them now? Well, the doctors. Yeah. They were ordered to follow the party line, and they did. Yeah, they did. Well, see, see, I've always been that reluctant, and that was in the free world. Now, even more so, I'm more reluctant to see a doctor. So, mm. Yeah. Okay. All right, now we're on to the retail banking inquiry. Did it make the news? Did we hear anything about this? I think I heard some sort of mention of it. Well, it was, it was Grant Robertson announcing that they're going to look into retail ban- banking. You know, they're, they're ignoring business banking, they're ignoring everything else. We're just going to have a look at whether or not we're being ripped off in retail banking for the ordinary customer. That, and aren't we nice guys in the Labour Party to do this? We can promise you we're going to we're going to get this inquiry and uh, then we're going to bash the banks. And this is just another classic case of kicking a can down the road, making a little bit of noise to try and keep people quiet. But the problem is, is there were all these other disasters that are happening all around them that this really didn't even get picked up very much by the, by the media or even talked about. And you, you have to really dig to, into a website on, you know, the horrid or, or stuffed or something like that to even find anything about it. So I think it was designed to be a distraction and announcement, but it's just superseded by all the lunacy that's going on within Labour at the moment. And, yeah, there's um, no inquiry into the, the, the fractional reserve banking system or the IMF. I noticed there was a, a few headlines that went totally unanalyzed in the paper last year with the IMF coming here and saying, tut, 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 you know, you're going to have to cool your economy and tut, 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 you know, people are going to have to uh, <laughs> tighten their belts. Um, and, and, you know, that's part of the WEF program. You know, they want economies to shrink. Well, the other thing that IMF came out, um, this week as well, <clears throat> just saying that you can't keep running deficits like the government's running them without there being a problem at some point. There has to be a, a time when that those cows come home. It's well, they have nothing to, nothing to show for it is what really uh, gets my goat. Just go back to Michael Wood. He spent $50 million on a feasibility study for a bike bridge across the harbour in Auckland. And then cancelled it. Well, that's fifty million dollars. I, I don't know how you can spend that much on that. I just well, don't know how I, you can spend that much. I mean, I think they've got shares and consultancy firms, and so they have all these inquiries and these investigations and these consultancies that come up with these reports with these astronomical, you know, amounts. Um, Wasn't Julian Genta's uh, boyfriend? slash partner um, in, involved in one of those consultancies? Uh, I believe so, but um, mm. I don't know the quantum of it. It's it's just unbelievable the amount of bullshit that goes on and the waste of money. I mean, what can you? 
how many hip replacements can you buy for $15 yeah. million? All right. So speaking of, of, of wasting money, we're on to the Future of Local Government report. And uh, I spoke to a Dunedin City Councillor about a week ago, and he was talking about their debt, which is next year will be $1.5 billion. It's a million dollars a week in interest, and they've only got 50,000 ratepayers, and they're the, the ratepayers are the lowest disposable income in the country. So these local government officials have taken New Zealand towns and cities into extreme debt. Nine million for a parking app and a few car parks. So there's another huge amount of money. You have to wonder how they got to that. So what's happening with the reform suggestions now that obviously has to address the rate system almost breaking? Well, you know who's responsible for that, don't you? Tell me. The, the Labour Party. Oh, <laughs> ding. Right? Because when they merged, they did, they you know, merged all these councils back in the 80s. Right. Yeah, we um, lost our little one, by the way. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah, Michael Bassett was the one who did all that. You should get Michael Bassett on your show and ask him, was it wise back then to allow councils to qualify for general competence when it came to borrowing money? Because that's what they allowed them to do back then when they did all those mergers and amalgamations, created all these um, you know, bigger cities out of smaller borough councils and things like that, they allowed them to have what was called general competence, which allowed them to then borrow against their rate payers. Right. And then as a result of that, the debt is just burgeoned because before they weren't allowed to do that. They only could spend the money they had from their rates. And so we've had all these, you know, huge, um, you know, white elephant projects that councils have run um, you've had massive failures like the, the sewage system and wastewater system up in um, you know Northland there. Um, you've got all the debacles that have happened in Auckland Council. And now we've got this, you know, a local government report where Labour's chosen handmaidens have basically delivered the left's wet dream of reform suggestions, which include taxpayers coughing up a billion dollars a year to help fund local councils on top of the rates they're already getting lowering the voting age to 16. I mean, 16-year-olds can't work out whether they're Arthur or Martha. And yeah. We're going we're gonna to let them have a vote. You know? Well, they're really wanting to get that one in at every turn, aren't they? Yeah, making STV compulsory for all councils. Well, it works just brilliantly in Wellington, doesn't it? You know, why do we have to have something that doesn't work in Wellington applied so it doesn't work anywhere else? And then, of course, we've got the taxes and the charges and the levies and everything else allowing the councils to, you know, choking the, like Auckland Council's been doing, putting in bike lanes, removing traffic lanes, creating congestion, and then saying, well, we're going to start charging you for that. Um, but the worst thing of it all is they're just basically removing one person, one vote, you know, universal suffrage and bringing in this co-governance by stealth in the background where councils will be able to appoint uh, unelected members um, with the same voting rights as elected councillors. And yeah, I don't know if it was that stealthy reading the report, Cam. Geez, it was just a socialist word salad. I would pull out one short little bit from it. It was, now is the time for change, a moment in history where councils and communities need to shift to new ways of doing things. Like a reset almost. But, but, like, but who asked this us? This means right. designing more reset. sustainable neighbourhoods, transitioning to a greener economy, <laughs> using new technologies and fully acknowledging social and te or or Waitangi responsibilities. Don't you love that? They say using new technologies. What's the first thing a city council wants to have? A rail system. 19th <laughs> century technology. Where's the new technologies? Robot cars and all of that sort of thing. I yeah. want one of those rocket Monitor. packs. <laughs> yeah, we all want, Jetsons. I want the Jetsons um, house. Yeah. Okay. And the teaching council banning a Christian school teacher for not using the right pronouns. Yeah, I want to talk about that a little bit because um, one of the things I noticed was that the teacher had a meeting from the student around February 2021 where he said, where she said it was against, uh, the teacher said it was against his religion. Um, the student attempted to compromise, suggesting the teacher used his preferred name, but 
uh, she or her pronouns. You know, I mean, okay, the kid's trying here. But again, this was refused with the teacher telling the student he did not want him to go down the path of sin, right? Now, yeah. people think that's twee, but it's not. Um, if you want a modern definition of what sin is, and I mean, we could have a theological debate another time, but it really means a path of self-indulgent destruction. Um, the best definition, I think, is that um, I know what the Shorter Catechism says, um, but let's stick with destruction, self-indulgent destruction. Um, he tried to say a person created and born as a male or female should live as they were born. And I believe that any deviation from this is a cause for confusion and harm in their lives. I mean, the schools basically, you know, the, the, well, he was disciplined and, and struck off um, for asserting something very sensible. And the tribunal said it had no hesitation in coming to the view that serious misconduct had indeed occurred but, you know, I just, I, it was almost, it's so sad. I mean, this teacher ought to take uh, a lesson that he or she maybe should be teaching in a Christian school, obviously, or one with a code of special character that allows for teachers to have a conscience concerning the ways of the Lord, according to our traditional religion. Um, aside from that, everything the teacher said is correct. And maybe one day when that same kid is having some kind of operation to detransition from her transitioned male identity and wants to sue her doctors for stuffing up her life and ability to bear children, shudder, um, wondering and vocalizing why there were no actual adults in her life to say, hey, I don't think this whole thing is maybe a good idea. Um, maybe only then might this young woman realize that perhaps there were people in her world um, that did try to do that, like this teacher, but she was so propagandized and messed up that she didn't see them as anything but an enemy. And now, of course, these kids are coached to, to view people with views like that well, as you can destroy a their life. fascist. You can easily destroy someone's life now just by saying something like that, and then you'll get a whole bunch of adults going well, I with mean, them. Well, nobody in this country will ever consider a person's religious conscience to be worth a discussion um, till, till, till it's a Muslim conscience not wanting to partake yeah, in such I can't wait. I, Yeah, I can't wait till it's a Muslim teacher that yeah. says that. Yeah, and, and see, only and then. see how they contort themselves into allowing that to continue. This whole pronouns thing just rips my undies anyway. I mean, That's this, such a bore, isn't th it? Th this is people insisting on controlling the way you speak about them when them. they're not there, right? Yeah. It's it's about because it's always third person pronouns, right? Yeah. So, but it's it's ludicrous. You know, either one to be called they or them or this or that or whatever. I want my pronouns to be told you so, but no one's going to honour that. Or what about um, handsome and brilliant? I'll have those as my pronouns and insist people use <laughs> those. <laughs> It's okay, handsome. okay, Mr. Handsome and Mr. Brilliant. One, that, one other that's point. the thing. It's, I know. It's, it's just know. ludicrous, controlling it's, language. The tribunal speech. said at risk belittling the student and minimizing the huge personal event occurring in his life, the teacher transgressed well out of the boundaries of a teacher's role. And, um, well, I mean, no, it stop, didn't. It stop didn't screwing with their minds. The, 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 the teaching council screwing with kids' minds. They're but actually, it's the school that commands yeah. the teachers to conform their language along this line. And then when they say, yeah, no, actually, I'm not going to do that, you know, they get slapped with this bullshit, which just forces them to career help destroyed, speech. Is what you have. What I can't yeah. understand, though, is, right, if you had a nine-year-old come up to you and say, look, um, Dad, um, oh, can you get a bottle of scotch out and you and I will get hammered now while we watch a movie? You'd say, go to your room. We'd give them a clip around the ear and say, go to your room, you stupid child. If they said, came to you and said, oh, look, Dad, can you take me out to K Road? I want to go and visit, um, you know, a gay nightclub and um, experience all that at nine years old. You clip them around the ears, say, "Go to your room. You're grounded." But the, you know what? Well, these they, kids they... then say, "I want to. I'm a. I'm a girl, but Dad, I'm not a girl anymore. I want to be a boy, and and um, you know, I want to have all the surgery and everything." And these parents are going, "Sure, no problem." No, imagine those conversations you know? in those homes. Like, why do they just this say, is the thing. "You're being is that... stupid. Go to your room." Yeah, being exactly. Yeah. Cut that nonsense out. 
Um, and why, I mean, you know, why doesn't the student privately go through this highly sexualized, ridiculous nonsense at a ma- as a matter between herself, her parents and her doctor? No, she demands to be within the boundaries of her school, teachers and classmates, therefore making it an issue for the teacher, one of the few who actually has a conscience in play and, say, you know, said so. But it's just so sad. Anyway, I hope he gets picked up by one of the Christian schools and gets a better job, you know. Probably will. All right. On that note, we're going to end our political panel. Thanks, everybody. Cam, Marty, Olivia. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, you guys. Thanks, guys. We'll we'll do it all again next Friday. All right. Have a great week. RCR with Paul Brennan. Reality Check Radio.